poetic anatomy and histology, especially exocrine, because we're looking at the GIT and we're interested in the production of enzymes that are involved in digestion and also production of secretions like bicarbonates, which is an exocrine function of the pancreas. The pancreatic secretions themselves, the enzymes, the bicarbonates, then small intestinal secretions. Okay. So we'll start by looking at revision of gastric emptying or control of gastric emptying. So this we've already covered. So what is going to facilitate the emptying of chyme from the stomach into the duodenum? So there are hormonal control and neural control of gastric emptying. An increase in the acid or fat or hypertonic solutions and distension of the small intestines will stimulate those cells or receptors that are sensitive to these chemicals and distension. So you have chemo receptors. We also have stretch receptors that will be stimulated. So via the secretions of enterogastron. So the enterogastron are the cells that are producing the hormones. So they're going to stimulate the secretion of enterogastron. So the enterogastron are the hormones or the GIT. So the hormones of the GIT, they are going to produce hormones. So this is a hormonal control. So an increase in the enterogastrons. So these enterogastrons can inhibit gastric emptying. So you know the hormones that will be produced there. Secretin, cholecystokinin, gastric inhibitory peptide. So those enterogastrons, they are going to be transported by the circulatory system to the stomach then they are going to decrease the secretions and the motility. Even gastric emptying is going to decrease with those hormones. Then you also have neurostimulation or neural pathway. So the presence of chemicals and distension is going to stimulate neural receptors. And via the long neural uh, reflexes and the short neural reflexes, the stomach can be inhibited. So you have short neural reflexes via the enteric neurons. So they are going to release much of no epinephrine that will inhibit gastric emptying. Long reflexes, you have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So the sympathetic is going to be stimulated more. The parasympathetic is going to decrease. So if you have more sympathetic, it's going to release no epinephrine that is going to to inhibit gastric secretions and gastric motility. So this is how the chyme is being emptied. So once you have movement of chyme into the duodenum, they will send inhibitory signal to inhibit the contract, contraction of the stomach to minimize the movement of chyme. That will provide enough time for neutralization of the acids and also to start digestion of fat, lipids, carbohydrates, whatever digestion is taking place there it will start. Okay. So now chyme has moved into the duodenum. What is going to be released? So like I said, we need to understand the histology and the physiology of the pancreas because the pancreas is going to release enzymes and bicarbonates into the duodenum. So what is the histology and the physiology of the pancreas? 100% of pancreatic mass 85% of that 100% is exocrine function. So exocrine pancreas, it's a, it's a bigger part of the pancreas as compared to the endocrine. So 85% exocrine pancreas, 10% extracellular matrix, 4% blood vessels in the duct system. 2% is the endocrine. So because we are dealing with the exocrine, you know to say that there are a lot of cells that are producing the enzymes. So it's very important to the function of the pancreas. Okay, so the anatomy of the pancreas, you have the tail, the neck, and the head. So the pancreatic tail, pancreatic neck, and the head. Then you have the duct system that will open into the duodenum. So that we already discussed. So you can see here the pancreas, you have the main pancreatic duct with a sphincter, 
and then the accessory pancreatic ducts with a minor opening. So you have the major opening and the minor opening. So the major opening of the, the hepatopancreatic ampulla, and then you have the minor. So in certain individuals, they don't have the minor, the accessory pancreatic duct, they don't have it, but others, they will have it, okay? So this is the sphincter of Audi. So under normal circumstances, the sphincter is closed. So the smooth muscles surrounding the sphincter of Audi, they are going to contract to inhibit the secretions from the pancreas and from the gallbladder. But there are signals that will come in to, to inhibit these muscles. So they are, you have more of relaxation, then there'll be pancreatic secretion and bowel duct secretion into the duodenum. So here is the minor duodenal papillae and the major duodenal papillae. So the minor duodenal papillae is coming from the accessory pancreatic duct. Then you have the major pancreatic ducts that will open into the major duodenal papillae. So same information, the pancreas and the liver. So the pancreas, you have the lobule. So the lobule, 85% of the lobule is the exocrine. Then you have the 10% extracellular matrix. Then you have 4% blood vessels. And then 2% is the exocrine. Okay, so we are interested in the exocrine or the secretory arsenide cells. And the isolates of Langer hands are the ones that are producing the hormones. So the arsenide cells are the ones that are producing the enzymes. So when you look at the arsenal cell here, it will contain a lot of zymogen. So zymogen granules, in the zymogen, zymogen granules, it will contain enzymes. So the production of enzymes, you know the pathway of protein production because enzymes are protein. So the information is coming from the nucleus. So DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA. That messenger RNA will leave the nucleus to go to the raffinopasmid reticulum for the synthesis of proteins. Then they'll be transported to the Golgi apparatus for modification into enzymes. And then those enzymes will be packaged into vesicles, which are called zymogens. So the zymogen granules are just vesicles containing enzymes. So if there's a signal for exocytosis, they will be released into the duct system. Then it will be transported to the duodenum via the, um, the ampulla the hepatopancreatic ampulla into the duodenum or the sphincter of Audi. Then this other part is producing the hormones. So you have the beta cells, the alpha cells that are producing insulin and glucagon. So for now, we are not interested with that part. We are just interested with the part that is producing the enzymes and the bicarbonates. So the duct system of the pancreas, the first part here is called the intercarotid ducts that will contain simple cubical epithelium. So you can see the simple cubical epithelium or the intercarotid ducts. And these intercarotid ducts, they are connected to the striated ducts. So the striated ducts are the ones that are receiving the secretions from the arsenal cells. So you can see the striated duct cells. So the striated duct cells, they're also called the intralobular ducts. So they are lined by cuboidal or low columnar cells with rounded nucleus. So you can see the rounded nucleus there. Then you have the interlobular or excretory duct. They are lined by the columnar cells. So they are here. The interlobular or excretory duct, they are the ones that are now responsible for excretion of whatever is coming from the arsenal cells. The interlobular ducts, they are lined by pseudo stratified columnar cells. Then you have the main duct that will open via the sphincter of odd. So the main duct is lined by stratified columnar, then stratified, then stratified square mass at the end. So they will start with stratified columnar, then at the end you have stratified uh, square mass epithelium cells. So this is more of histology, I'm not interested, but just need to know that there's a duct system that will transport the secretions to the sphincter of Audi. Okay, so what is stimulating the pancreatic secretions? So the pancreatic secretions is an alkaline liquid. So the pH, in the previous lecture, we said the pH is between 8.0 to 8.4. 
is the one that will have the highest pH, which is alkaline. So here it's 8.3 maximum, but anyway, it's acceptable. 8.0 to 8.4, somewhere there. So the pancreatic secretions will have the highest pH or the alkaline pH. So they are secreted by the pancreas, which contains a variety of enzymes. So in terms of production is between one liter to about 1.5 liter. 1,000 uh, milliliters or 1,500 milliliters. That would be the quantity of pancreatic secretions. The composition of the pancreatic secretions. So of course you have enzymes, you have bicarbonates. So the first component is a solution of bicarbonates, electrolytes like sodium, uh, potassium and water. That is being produced by the epithelium cells lining the pancreatic duct. So those arsenal cells. So not necessarily the arsenal cells, the arsenal cells are producing much of the enzymes, but the ductal cells are the ones that are releasing a lot of bicarbonates and electrolytes. Okay, so the ductal cells, the epithelium cells of the duct system are the ones that are producing much of bicarbonate, sodium, electrolytes, and water. So because you have a lot of bicarbonates, the solution is alkaline. So this alkaline solution is designed to help neutralize the stomach acid so that digestive enzyme can work more effectively. So there is a lot of production of bicarbonates that will neutralize the acidic chyme after gastric emptying. So you know to say that the enzymes in the duodenum they will operate well at neutral or alkaline pH. So for them to be alkaline, there is need for neutralization to take place. So this neutralization will provide the good environment for enzyme to operate. Otherwise, if there's no neutralization, there will be no much of digestion taking place in the duodenum. Then the second component is the enzymatic component, the enzymes, which includes a lot of enzymes. The first enzyme is trypsinogen. So trypsinogen is the major enzyme that is involved in the activation of other enzymes. That's why here is highlighted in green. So trypsinogen can be converted into trypsin. There is another enzyme that is produced by the, the epithelium cells of the duodenum. They are called the enterokinase. So that enterokinase can activate trypsinogen into trypsin, and then trypsin will start activating other enzymes like the chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin, it can also activate the pro peptidase into the active form. So these are some of the enzymes that are associated with the pancreatic secretions. So trypsinogen, the chymotrypsinogen, the pro peptidase, then you also have the pancreatic amylase, just like we have salivary amylase, even the pancreas, they are production of amylase, that will also start the digestion or continue the digestion of carbohydrates. Then we have pancreatic lipase. So uh, pancreatic lipases, we have lipase itself, cholesterol, esterase, phospholipase. So these will continue with the digestion of lipids. And then deoxyribonucleases and ribonucleases, they will continue the digestion of nucleic acid like DNA and RNA. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about that the hormone and the enzyme, a precursor, which is being produced there, it's in active form, it's called the trypsinogen, that will be converted by the enterokinase. The enterokinase is being produced by the epithelium cells of the duodenum, so they are producing a lot of enterokinase. Then the enterokinase at the brush border of the microvilli, they will convert trypsinogen into trypsin, and then trypsin will activate other enzymes. So the trypsin can also activate other trypsinogen into trypsin. Then they will also convert other enzymes like trypsinogen into another trypsin. And then the chymotrypsinogen, it will be converted into chymotrypsin. The proelastase will be converted into elastase. Then you have procarboxypeptidase. They will be now converted into carboxypeptidase. So these enzymes now are active. They will continue with the digestion. But remember, here we're just interested in the secretions, but later on we'll discuss the digestion. This table is summarizing the secretions that are coming from the pancreas. So you have the source of the secretion, the enzymes that are found there, the activator of that enzyme, the substrate, and the catalytic function 
and the products or the products. So this is more of digestion. So we'll repeat ourselves when we start looking at digestion. So some of the enzymes that are being produced there, this is the, the pancreas. So you have the exocrine pancreas. So the exocrine uh, pancreas is the one that is producing the enzymes. Like trypsin is being produced as trypsinogen. So it will be activated by the enteropeptidase. So the enterokinase, another name for the enterokinase is called the enteropeptidase because it's going to cleave off certain amino acids from the trypsinogen to convert it into trypsin. So once it's going to be converted into trypsin, it will continue with the digestion of proteins. So proteins and polypeptides are the substrate. So it's going to cleave peptide bonds on the carboxyl side of the basic amino acids like arginine and lysine. So it will continue the digestion of protein. The chemotrypsins, so the activator of chemotrypsin is trypsin. So trypsin is going to activate the, uh, the, the chemotrypsinogen into trypsins. Then the trypsins can also work on proteins and polypeptides. So they are going to cleavage a peptide bond on the carboxyl side of aromatic amino acids. Then elastase, they are produced as proelastase. They will be activated by trypsin into elastase. Then they will start the digestion of elastin. So elastin and some other proteins will be digested. Okay, and then you have carboxylpeptidase A that will be activated. Carboxylpeptidase B that will also be activated. So they are being produced as pro-carboxylpeptidase A and pro-carboxypeptidase B. So they'll be activated by trypsin. Colipase is being produced as pro-colipase. So pro-colipase will be activated by trypsin. Pancreatic lipase is also activated. So pancreatic lipase is mainly already activated. So it doesn't need an activator there. So it will continue the digestion of fat. So the major substrate there is triglycerides. Then you also have the bowel salt acid lipase. Bowel salt acid lipase can also work on cholesterol esters, you know, to convert them into cholesterol. So there are a bunch of these enzymes that we'll be discussing tomorrow. So these are the secretions that are coming from the pancreas. The activator of those enzymes and the substrate they are going to operate on and the major function, the catalytic function of those um, enzymes. So even the, the pancreas secretions, they are divided into phases. So just like we had three phases of gastric secretions, the cephalic phase, the gastric phase, and the intestinal phase, even the pancreatic secretions, they are divided into three phases. So the first phase is also called the cephalic phase. So the same never signals from the brain that causes the secretion in the stomach also cause acetylcholine release by the vagal nerve ending in the pancreas. So the same acetylcholine that is being released to the stomach is also being released to the pancreas. It will have the same effects. So this will cause moderate amounts of enzymes to be secreted into the pancreatic arsenal, accounting for about 20% or the total secretion of the pancreatic enzymes after a meal. So in the cephalic phase, as you are looking at nice food, sight of nice food, taste of nice food, smell of nice food, you can also have cephalic phase of pancreatic secretion, whereby you have the vagus nerve that will go and release acetylcholine to the pancreas, causing release of enzymes. So, but little of the secretions flow immediately through the pancreatic duct into the intestine because only a small amount of water and electrolytes are secreted along with the enzymes. So there is secretion of enzymes, but these enzymes are not necessarily transported to the duodenum. but there's an increase in the secretion of enzymes. But there's less water, there's less electrolytes. So the enzymes will stay within the duct system. Okay, but there's an increase in the secretion. So it's called the cephalic phase of pancreatic secretion. Then the second phase is gast gastric phase. So the nervous stimulation of the enzyme 
secretion continues. So during the gastric phase, the nervous stimulation or the enzyme is going to continue, accounting for another five to 10% of the pancreatic enzyme secreted after a meal. But again, only small amount will reach the duodenum because, because of continued lack of significant fluid secretion. So here, there are also some enzymes that are being secreted, about five to 10%. During the spheric phase, we say 20%. Gastric phase about five to ten percent, but there is less secretions of water, so these enzymes are not being transported to the duodenum again. But during intestinal phase now, when the chyme has moved into the intestine, so after chyme leaves the stomach and enters the small intestines, the pancreatic secretion become copious, mainly in response to the hormone secreting and cholecystokinin. So when chyme is emptied into the duodenum, the air cells will be stimulated to release a lot of secretin. That secretin will cause the ductal cells to release a lot of electrolytes by carbonate and water. Then the cholecystokinin will stimulate the arsenal cells to release a lot of enzymes. So now you have more enzymes, you have more electrolytes, you have more water that is being secreted into the duct system. So the quantity of the secretions is going to increase here during the intestinal phase. So now they will be transported by the duct system via the sphincter of Audi. If it's open, then the pancreatic secretions will be released into the duodenum to go and neutralize the acid, the bicarbonate, and the enzymes will start the digestion of those macromolecules. So the stimulus for pancreatic uh, secretions so in this diagram, you can see the cholecystokinin. So in the duodenum, during intestinal phase, there is emptying of chyme into the duodenum that will stimulate the eye cells to produce a lot of cholecystokinin. So in the duodenum, if chyme is emptied into the duodenum, you have peptide amines, and then you also have peptides, you have peptides, amino acids, you have fatty acids, and hydrogen ions. So all these chemicals will stimulate the, the eye cells to release cholecystokinin. So the eye cells will release cholecystokinin and this cholecystokinin will be transported by the circulatory system to the pancreas, then to cause the arsenal cells to release a lot of enzymes. So you can see it's being transported to the pancreas, the arsenal cells will release now enzymes. So there'll be enzymes that will be released. And of course, you have the vagus afferent nail via the vago vago reflex. It will go and stimulate the arsenal cells to release more of enzymes. So the parasympathetic can also cause the pancreas to release a lot of enzymes. Okay. Then <clears throat> serotonin can also stimulate the eye cells to release a lot of um, cholecystokinin. So you can see via these receptors, 5H. HT receptors where serotonin can go and stimulate the eye cells to produce a lot of cholecystokinin. Then the presence of fats and peptides and also hydrogen ions, especially the hydrogen ions, they are going to stimulate the S cells. So the S cells down there will be stimulated and they are going to release secretin and the secretin will go and stimulate the ductal cells to release a lot of electrolytes and bicarbonates. So the bicarbonates will be released, that will start the neutralization of fat. That's why the hydrogen ions are the ones that are stimulating the S cells. Because the presence of the hydrogen ions, it means that the chyme is very acidic, so you need to neutralize the acid. So the acid itself, which is hydrogen ions, will stimulate the S cells to release secretin. Then secretin will go and stimulate the ductal cells to release a lot of bicarbonates, the bicarbonates will go and neutralize the acid, providing the conducive environment for enzymes to start the digestion in the duodenum. Then the control of pancreatic function. So if you have an increase in acid from the stomach because you have a gastric empty, so that acid is entering the small intestines, so the small intestines will be stimulated to release a lot of secretin. So secretin secretion is going to increase 
the plasma secreting level is going to increase and then to go to the pancreas transported by the circulatory system. Within the pancreas, it will increase the ductal cells to release a lot of bicarbonate. So you can see bicarbonate secretion is increasing. And then the flow of bicarbonate into small intestines will increase via the sphincter of OD. The bicarbonate will enter the duodenum or the proximal part of the small intestines that will cause neutralization of the intestinal acids. And then the pH will increase to become slightly acidic or neutral or slightly alkaline. Then those enzymes will be activated to start the digestion. If there's an increase in the intestinal fatty acids and amino acids, they are going to stimulate the eye cells to release a lot of polycystokine. So the plasma polycystokine concentration is going to increase, transported by the circulatory system to the pancreas. It will go and stimulate the arsenal cells to increase the production and secretion of enzymes. Enzyme will be secreted into the duct system that will transport the enzyme into the small intestines via the sphincter of OD. In the small intestines, there will be an increase in the digestion of fat and proteins once you have those enzymes from the pancreas. Combining everything, the intestinal phase of secretion. So now the effect of combining everything, the two hormones. So we have peptides, amino acids, fat, and hydrogen ions. So the peptides and amino acids, they are going to stimulate more of the eye cells to release cholecystokine. The hydrogen ions, they are going to stimulate the A cells to release more of secretin. So the peptides, amino acids, they are stimulating the eye cells to release a lot of cholecystokine hormone that will be transported to the pancreas. The hydrogen ions, they are stimulating the A cells to release a lot of secretin. So secretin is going to increase, secretin secretion is going to increase. What is the function of secretin? It's going to stimulate the duct cells. So both the enzyme and bicarbonates are going to be released. Then on top of that, you have the neuro via the vagovago uh, vago reflexes. You have the release of acetylcholine to the cholecystokine producing cells and secretin producing cells. That will increase the production of these two hormones. Then you also have neuro innovation to the arsenal cells and the ductal cells that can also enhance the production of the enzymes and bicarbonates that will be later on released into the duct system. So, so you can see via the vagus nerve, acetylcholine is also enhancing the production of enzymes and secretion of enzyme from the arsenal cells and from the duct cells. So you have the bicarbonates and the enzymes that will be released into the duodenum. Okay, so this is the multiplicative effect of different stimuli. So the two hormones and the neural stimulation, they are going to increase the release of bicarbonates and the enzymes. The bicarbonates will neutralize the acid, the enzymes will start the digestion. So you can see the hydrochloric acid and the bicarbonates that will react with hydrochloric acid to neutralize it into weak acids like bicarbonates. Then another factor that you need to understand is the inhibition of trypsin. So you have trypsin inhibitor. Remember, trypsin is being produced as trypsinogen in the pancreas by the arsenal cells. By this trypsinogen, it's inactive state. But sometimes you can have activation of trypsin, I mean, trypsinogen into trypsin within the pancreas. That can cause digestion of the pancreas, resulting into acute pancreatitis or inflammation of the pancreas. So God designed it in such a way that within the pancreas, you have factors that is going to inhibit the activation of trypsinogen into trypsin. So the pro uh, proteolytic enzyme or the pancreas will not become activated until after they have been secreted into the intestine. So the trypsinogen will not be activated until it has been secreted into the duodenum via the sphincter of OD. Because that's where you find the enterokinins or the enteropeptidase that will activate the trypsinogen into trypsin. 
So the enterokinase, you won't find it in the pancreas, but in the pancreas, you're going to have trypsin inhibitor. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, the trypsin in the other enzyme would digest the pancreas itself mm -hmm. if it's activated there. So trypsin inhibitor is going to prevent the activation of trypsin and so other enzymes inside the secretory cells and in the arsenal cells, cholecystokinin, you know, epinephrine, histamine, how is it going to increase the secretions and also the production of acids. So it's via the G-protein coupled receptor. So this information you already know to say, if cholecystokinin go and bind to cholecystokinin receptors of those cells, there will be activation of the G-protein and uh, beta gamma protein subunit can catalyze the reaction that will convert phosphatidylinositobisphosphate into DAG and IP3. The IP3 will mobilize calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum or from the endoplasmic reticulum. And this calcium will enhance exocytosis of neurotransmitters or exocytosis of enzymes in this case. So you need calcium to enhance exocytosis of enzymes from the arsenal cells. Or the same calcium can go and activate protein kinase C and also DAG. Diacylglycyl molecule can also go and uh, activate the protein kinase C. This protein kinase C is responsible for enhancing the exchange of hydrogen with sodium. So it's going to activate sodium hydrogen exchanger. That will cause now hydrogen ion to be pumped into the lumen, increasing the production of acids. So this is just a mechanism, but it's just simple mechanism that you already understand, the function of G-protein coupled receptors. So if the, uh, what you're looking at are arsenal cells that are producing enzymes and stored within the vesicles, which are called zymogenes. So if you have cholecystokinin, for instance, it will come and bind to cholecystokinin receptor on the arsenal cells. Then it will mobilize calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum, that calcium will enhance exocytosis. It can go and bind to V-snare, T-snare. V-snare, T-snare interaction, synaptobrevin syntaxing interaction will bring about exocytosis of enzymes in this case. So enzymes now will be released into the lumen or the duct system that will be transported by the ductal system via the sphincter of uh, OD. So you can see the arsenal cells they will, have, they will contain a lot of zymogenes because the production of um, enzymes, enzymes are protein in nature. So you know the pathway that will result into production of proteins. So DNA transcription, messenger RNA translation into a protein packaged into vesicles within the rough endoplasmic clump, transported to the Golgi apparatus for modification into a particular shape. Then the finished product will be packaged into vesicles, which are called zymogens, just waiting for the signal for exocytosis. So the signal for exocytosis, you need calcium. So for calcium to be mobilized, you need the presence of cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin goes and activate the G-protein coupled receptor that will activate the phospholipase C that will break down phosphatidyl inositobisphosphate into DAG and IP3. IP3 can go and bind to the IP3 receptors of Endoplasmic reticulum mobilizing calcium. Calcium will move into the cytoplasm of the cells and then it can go and bind to this near t snare interaction, bring about exocytosis of enzymes. So now enzymes are being released. That's why we are saying that cholecystokinin is going to facilitate or to stimulate the exocytosis of the neurotransmitter. Okay. So we proceed. So the mechanism of, of the, the secretin mechanism of action. So we know the action of cholecystokinin. So how is secretin going to stimulate the ductal cells to release a lot of bicarbonates? So the bicarbonates is coming from that reaction where carbon dioxide is reacting with water with the presence of carbonic anhydrates that will be converted into carbonic acid to dissociate itself into bicarbonates and hydrogen ions. The bicarbonates can be exchanged with sodium or it can be pushed into the lumen. Okay, so how is secretin coming in? So here is secretin. So secretin is produced by the A cells with the presence of hydrogen ions that are stimulating the A cells in the duodenum. 
they are going to produce a lot of secretin. Secretin will be transported by the secretory system. It will go and bind to G protein coupled receptors that will help convert ATP into cyclic AMP. You know, to say G protein coupled receptors, the adenylcyclase enzyme is the one that is breaking down ATP into cyclic AMP. The cyclic AMP will go and activate the protein kinase A, and the protein kinase A will enhance translocation of uh, chloride channels. So you have the chloride channels that will be incorporated in the apicocyte to allow movement of chloride. This chloride that is moving into the lumen will be exchanged for bicarbonates. So you need the chloride to be exchanged for bicarbonate. The bicarbonate now is pushed into the lumen. So you have a lot of bicarbonate. So the bicarbonate point intestines, they are enzymes. So the source of the enzyme, the enzyme itself, the activator, the substrate, and the catalytic function of the products. So you have different types of enzymes. So here I'll just mention the enzymes and then we'll proceed. The digestion itself, we'll cover it later on. So the enzymes that are being secreted within the intestinal mucosa, you have the enteropeptidase, which are called the enterokinase. The same enzyme that is responsible to activate the trypsinogen into trypsin. Then we also have aminopeptidase, carboxyopeptidase, endopeptidase, dipeptidase, maltose, lactase, sucrase, and the alpha dextrinase, the trihalase, and then you also have the nuclease and related enzymes that are responsible for the digestion of nucleic acid. Then you also have various uh, peptidase. So in the cytoplasm or the mucosal cells, you can also have peptidase. So there is digestion that is also taking place within the, the mucosal cells, the epithelium cells of the intestine. So after absorption of peptidase, they can be digested within the cells. Okay, they are not being secreted, but they are in the cytoplasm of these cells. Okay, so these are the enzymes. So the small intestines, the submucosal glands of Rebacon, so the submucosal glands of the ribacon, they are producing uh, viscous mucus. And this viscous mucus, like you know, the, the function of mucus is going to be protective. So they're going to protect the damage of the mucosa. So protection of damage to the mucosa is protected by the mucus produced by the submucosal glands of ribacon. Then you have the panic cells, the panic cells are producing enterokinase. So they are the ones that are responsible for the production of enteropeptidase that will activate the pancreatic zymogens. So the first uh, enzyme that will be activated is trypsinogen into trypsin. Then there's auto activation of more trypsinogen into trypsin. Then those active trypsin will activate other enzymes. The goblet cells are also producing mucus. And this mucus contain a lot of bicarbonates. So the mucus produced by the goblet cells are responsible for lubrication and also neutralization of acids to protect the intestinal lining from the acids. The composition of intestinal secretions. So under normal circumstances, the small intestines, you're producing about 1.5 liters of the secretions, the pH somewhere around 7.6, this is on average. You have more water, 98.5%, and solids less, 1.5%, of which that 1.5% is divided into inorganic and organic. The inorganic is 0.7%, so inorganic you're talking of electrolytes. So cations, positively charged ions, and anions, negatively charged ions. So the cations, which are positively charged ions, you have sodium, potassium, calcium and magnesium. And then the negatively charged anions, mainly have chloride, bicarbonates, and phosphates. Then on the other side, the inorganic 0.8%, mainly is mucus and enzymes. So these enzymes are called brush border enzymes. So they are brush border enzymes because they are found on the apicocyte of epithelium cells on the microvilli. So they are brush border. After digestion there, there will be absorption. So they are on the blood, blood, uh, brush border. They are called brush border enzymes. So later on, when we start looking at digestion and absorption, once digestion has taken place by the brush border enzyme, then there will be absorption taking place as well. So these are the villi. On the villi, you have the microvilli. So on the microvilli, you have the finger-like projections, which are called 
microvilli, and then they have the membrane, which is called the blush border membrane. That's where you find those enzymes that are responsible to finish up the digestion and also to allow absorption to take place. So the crypts of rebacon are the ones that are producing viscous mucus. So you have this heavy mucus that is produced by the crypts of rebacon. The enzymes, you have the enterokinase, of course, the proteolytic enzyme, elapsin and nucleases, the sucrase, maltose, lactase, and the alpha dextrinase, the intestinal lipase, the cholesterol esterase, and the lysethinase, lys 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 that is responsible to digest a special type of a fat, lymphacin. So lymphacinase is an enzyme also that is produced by the intestines. You have the alkaline phosphatase. So these are the enzymes that are produced by the intestines. So intestinal enzymes. So the presence of food, chemicals, mechanical stimuli is going to increase the intestinal secretions. So this is a stimulus that will increase the intestinal secretions that will contain those enzymes. So local elitation will stimulate the goblet cells to stimulate those cells that are producing mucus. So mucus secretion is going to increase because of elitation of the intestines, mucosa. Vagal stimulation is also going to enhance the secretion of the Brunner's glands. So the Brunner's glands will be stimulated to release a lot of secretions. Okay, the biliary secretions, this is, these are the secretions of the liver. So the liver is producing bowel salts, which is involved in the emulsification process of fat. So without bowel salts and bowel acids, the digestion of lipids is very difficult because the do uh, lipid droplets are very huge, they are big. So enzymes, it's very difficult for them to break down the, the lipids if there's no emulsification taking place. So the liver is producing bowel. And if the sphincter of OD is still closed, bowel will be stored within the gallbladder. So if the gallbladder stores uh, the bowel, there will be modification of bowel. There will be reabsorption of water. There will be concentration of bowel salts in the gallbladder. Okay? If there is no storage, there's no modification. So whatever is being produced from the liver, they need to be secreted via the sphincter of OD. So just like we saw the function of the pancreas, you have also the function of the gallbladder and the liver itself in the production of bowel salts. So introduction to the production of bowel salts. So almost 500 milliliters of bowel is secreted every day. Then the bowel is secreted continuously by the hepatocytes. So hepatocytes are the ones that are producing bowel. And if not immediately required, like I said, if they are not immediately required for digestion, they are going to be stored within the gallbladder. So bowel is secreted by the hepatic cells into the bowel duct, which drains into the duodenum. So bowel is secreted into the hepat by the hepatic cells into the bowel duct. Then there will be a bit of modification there. Then the bowel duct will drain bowel into the duodenum. So between meals, the duodenal orifice of this duct is going to be closed. The sphincter of OD is going to be closed. So bowel is going to flow into the gallbladder and stored there. So the flow of bowel into the gallbladder, into, into the gallbladder is when the sphincter of OD is still closed. If there is empty, emptiness in the stomach and in the small intestines, there will be no signal that will cause relaxation of the sphincter of OD. Then the bowel will be stored within the gallbladder. But when food enters the mouth, the sphincter of OD will start to relax. So you also have phases of uh, bowel secretion. So the cephalic phase, intestinal, uh, the gastric phase, and intestinal phase. Okay, so it's similar even here. So when the gastric contents enter the duodenum, the hormone cholecystokinin from the intestinal mucosa causes the gallbladder to contract and relaxation of the sphincter of OD. So the same cholecystokinin that is being produced by the eye cells in the lumen or the duodenum, I mean, in the mucosa or the duodenum by the eye cells 
The same cholecystokinin that is increasing the production and secretion of enzymes within the pancreas, it can go and cause contraction of the gallbladder. Remember, the gallbladder has got smooth muscles. So if cholecystokinin goes and binds cholecystokinin receptors, there will be activation of G-protein, mobilization of calcium, and that calcium can go and bind to camodulin. calcium camodulin complex will activate the mouse in night chain kinase that will phosphorylate the mouse in hands that will bring about smooth muscle contraction. So as the smooth muscle are contracting of the gallbladder, you are squeezing bowel into the bowel duct and then that bowel will be released into the duodenum. Okay, so the structure of the liver, you have the liver lobule. The liver, liver lobule at the center have the central vein that will drain the products from the liver. Then you have the triad. The triad, you have three structures, the bowel, canaliculus, then you have the hepatic artery and the hepatic vein. So the hepatic porter vein, the hepatic porter vein is transporting nutrients or whatever has been absorbed from the JIT into the liver. Then you have the hepatic artery that will bring up um, other nutrients and oxygen to the liver itself. Then you have the, the bowel duct. The bowel duct are the ones that are responsible for the transportation of bowel. So this is a structure of the liver lobule. The hepatocytes are the ones that are responsible for the production of bowel. Okay, so the movement of bowel in the blood from the hepatic porter vein is the opposite. So you can see the movement of blood from the hepatic porter vein or triad is from the hepatic porter vein towards the central vein but bowel is moving from the cells or from the central vein towards the bowel duct. Okay, so this is a movement of blood and bowel. So as, as the hepatic porter vein is transporting nutrients from the JIT to the liver, then some of the metabolism is taking place within the hepatocytes. So that's why the movement is from the portal triad towards the hepatocytes. Then the movement of bowel is being produced by the hepatocytes. So it will be from the hepatocytes towards the bowel duct. Then the other one is the hepatic artery. Okay, so it's basically the same structure. So you can see, the, you can also appreciate the kofa cells that are responsible for phagocytosis of pathogens within the, the senocytes. The senocytes, so you can see that you have fenestrations lining within the period cells that will allow movement of nutrients and whatever is moving into the liver. The triad system here, the bowel ducts, the hepatic porter vein, and the artery itself. So the movement of bowel is towards the bowel duct or the bowel, uh, bowel canaliculus. And then the movement of blood is from the porter vein towards the central vein. And then the artery, the movement of blood is from the artery water artery into the hepatocytes. So that histology, you know, but what is the composition of the bowel? So secretion and storage of bowel. So what is the composition of bowel? So the composition of bowel, it will have water, 98% will be water. So in the liver, but in the gallbladder, because there is modification taking place there, you find that the water is reduced to 92% because some of the water has been reabsorbed by the mucosa or the, or the gallbladder. Remember, you can have reabsorption of water and electrolytes. So you find that the water percentage in the gallbladder has been reduced because of reabsorption. The bowel salts in the liver is 1%, but in the gallbladder is 6%. It doesn't mean that the quantity of bowel salts has increased. It doesn't mean that the gallbladder is producing more bowel salts. No. The percentage of bowel salts is increasing because there is modification. So if you are reabsorbing much of the water, the concentration of solutes is going to increase. That's why the percentage here is increasing. The bilirubin, so in the liver 0 0.04, but in the gallbladder is 0 0.04, I mean 0 0.3, meaning that has increased. So the concentration is increasing. So it's the same for cholesterol. Here it's 0 0.1, but in the gallbladder 0 0.3 to 0 0.9%. Fatty acids in the liver, 0.12 in the liver hepatocytes, but in the gallbladder, you have 0.3 to 1.2%. Then lecithin, 
0 0.04 in the liver, that of the gallbladder 0 0.4. So it means that the concentration is increasing because what we are reabsorbing is much of water. So the concentration of you know, organic substances is going to increase in the gallbladder after reabsorption of water. That is a modification. But what is the function of the bowel? Major functions of the bowel, they are responsible for emulsification of fats. So emulsification of fat. So fat molecules are broken down into smaller, smaller molecules that will allow now the enzyme to digest or to break down those smaller pieces. Otherwise, if you have just a chunk of fat, it's very difficult for this uh, enzyme to find a site where it's going to break it down. So that's why emulsification of fat is very important. It's done by the bowel salts and the bowel acids. So the other function of the bowel salts, it's going to increase absorption of lipids in the enterocytes, also in increasing the absorption of lipid soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, and C. So um, absorption of fat soluble vitamin is facilitated by the bowel salts that will cause emulsification of fats. So it's also going to increase the synthesis and secretion of bowel because there is a circulation of bowel. So you find that most of the bowel that is released into the delta it will be absorbed by the ileum. And then that bowel will move back to the liver that will enhance more production of bowel. So we find that bowel itself will increase the synthesis and the secretion of bowel. Cholesterol excretion, so bowel is the only route in which cholesterol is being excreted from the body. So you find that cholesterol will be part of bowel. They need to be excreted into the lumen, then via the anus, it will be excreted to the outside world. So excretion of, excretion of breakdown products of hemoglobin, like bilirubin, is also by bowel. So bowel is excreting a lot of cholesterol and bilirubin. Okay. So this is a structure of bowel salt or bowel acid it has got two sides, non-polar side and the polar side. So bowel is also referred to as antipathic molecule, meaning that it has got one side that can relate with fat and another side that can relate with water. So it's a hydrophobic and hydrophilic at the same time. So because of that, it's going to to help in emulsification of fat. So this is the structure. So most of these bowel salts are derived from cholesterol. So you can see in the structure of bowel salts or bowel acids, you have the central part, which is basically the structure of cholesterol and the other groups that are attached to form different types of bowel salts and bowel acids. So a molecular model of a bowel salt on top here, under A, with a cholesterol-derived core. So you can see the structure shown in yellow here, this is cholesterol for the formation of bowel acids and bowel salts. But the one that is down here is just in another example of bowel acids. So a space feeding model of a bowel salt. So bowel salts down there. Okay, so I have already explained that they'll have a non-polar surface that will help emulsify fat. And then they also have a polar surface that will promote water solubility. So they can interact with water and fat at the same time. So they are very important in the emulsification of fat. So the composition of bowel again here, you can see in the hepatic. So you have water and solutes. So solutes is just 4%. So water here, it will be something like 96% in this diagram or this example. But as you are moving to the gallbladder, in the gallbladder, the water percentage is going to reduce because much of the water is being reabsorbed. So the solute concentration is going to increase. Here it was 4%, but down here it's 10%. So the solutes, which is 10%, is composed mainly of bowel acids, 64%. So bowel acids and bowel salts, 64% of the solutes. Then 18% are phospholipids, 8% cholesterol, then 17% electrolytes like sodium, bicarbonates, and just think of all the electrolytes. Bilirubin is 2%, then protein 1%. So that's why I'm saying bowel is the only route by which bilirubin and cholesterol is going to be excreted from the body. You know, we have bad cholesterol, good cholesterol. So if you want to excrete a lot of cholesterol, it's via the bowel. So if you have 
diseases that are obstructing the emptying of bowel, then you find that the accumulation of cholesterol in the body, the accumulation of bilirubin that can predispose you to conditions like jaundice and other conditions. So the major components of bowel, I think we've already described that. So liver is going to secrete about 600 to 1,200 milliliters of bowel per day into the duodenum. But the composition of bowel, you have bowel salts, phospholipids like phosphatidylcholine, the bowel pigments, the cholesterol itself, water, which is a major part, and electrolytes. So it's something that we've already discussed. Okay, so the bowel salts or the bowel acids rather are synthesized from cholesterol. So these bowel acids, they are mainly produced from cholesterol. So the bowel acids secreted into the bowel are conjugated to glycine and tylen. So they are a derivative of cysteine. So the glycine and tylen are a derivative of cysteine, we know that. So the four major bowel acids that are found in human body have cholic acid. So these are the major bowel acids that are found in a human body. The cholic acid, the kinoduoxcholic acid, the duoxcholic acid, and the cholic acid. So these are the two, I mean, four different types of bowel acids that are produced in the human body. So the first two, the cholic acid and the kinoduoxcholic acid are called primary acids. Then the other two are produced from the primary acids. So they are called secondary acids. So the other two down here, the duoxcholic acid, and the folcholic acid, these are called the secondary acids, bowel acids. Okay? So the deoxcholic acid is produced from the cholic acid after the removal of hydrogen ions from the cholic acid. Then the folcholic acid is produced from keno deoxcholic acid after the removal of hydrogen ions from that compound. Okay, so this diagram will summarize what I was just trying to explain. So we say that the bowel acids are produced from cholesterol. So they are derivative of cholesterol. So cholesterol can be converted into a bowel acid. So you have the folic acid and kinocholic, kinoduoxcholic acid down here. So the first two are called the primary bowel acids that can be converted into secondary bowel acids. So the secondary bowel acids are the two here. So they Cholic acid, which is primary, can be converted into deoxcholic acid. So it's called deoxcholic acid because on one carbon, you remove the hydrogen ions. So you can see here the hydroxyl group, rather. So if you remove the hydroxyl group here from the cholic acid, it will be converted into deoxcholic acid, which is a secondary bowel acid. Then if you remove the hydroxyl group from the keno deoxcholic acid, it will be converted into the folcholic acid. So the two are secondary, the other two are primary, but they are part of the bowel that is secreted. And we've already mentioned the major function of bowel salts. So they are responsible for emulsification of fat and absorption in the small intestines. They are amphipathic, meaning that they'll have hydrophilic and hydrophobic domains. So there's one part that loves to be in water and the other part love to be in fat. So they are able to split the fat. That's why they are involved in emulsification of fat. So bowel acids tend to form micelles. So they'll form micelles that are responsible for emulsification of fat. So bowel salts are much more polar than bowel acids. So the bowel salts are much more polar than bowel acids. Why is because on the bowel salts, if you combine bowel acids with electrolytes, they will be converted into bowel salts. So that's the difference between a bowel acids and bowel salts. So in bowel salts, you have electrolytes that are attaching to the bowel acids component. Then they will be converted into bowel salts. So it means that in the bowel salts, they are much more polar than the bowel acid because of those electrolytes that are attaching to them. So they will facilitate lipid absorption. So this is what I'm trying to say. So you can see the bowel acids, like the glycocholic acid. So you have glycine that is attached to cholic acid, which forms 
the glycocolic acid, but it can be converted into uh, a salt when you add maybe sodium or sulfate, when you add sodium or potassium on the carboxyl group. Then you have down here the tyrokinodioxcholic acid that will have the tyrene amino acids that are attaching to the uh, kinodioxcholic acid. So it's called the tyrokinodioxcholic acid. Then when you add salts on the sulfates group here, then they'll be converted into bio salts. So e.g., when you have sodium, okay, let's start on top here. So the bio salts, the hydroxyl group of glycine. So this hydroxyl group of glycine, or um, the sulfur trioxide of the toluene. So you can see on the tyrene here, you have the sulfate group. The sulfur trioxide group on the tyrene is conjugated by bio by bow acids when they bind with cations. So cations are those positively charged ions like sodium and potassium. So when sodium goes and bind to the uh, carboxyl group here or to the sulfur trioxide group here, then it will be converted into salts like glycocholate salt. So you have the glycocholate, which is a bow, acid, bow salts. Then you can also convert it into tyrokinodioxcholate meaning that you've added maybe sodium or potassium on the hydroxyl group or on the sulfur group. Not sulfur group, but uh, sulfur trioxide group or the bio salts. Emulsification of fat is taking place here. So you have the bio salts that are antipathic uh, molecules, hydrophilic and hydro, hydrophilic and lipophilic ends. So they can interact with the fat. So you can see the fat globule, which is very huge. Then when you add the bio salts, they will emulsify the bio salts to form the missiles. So you can see the missiles that are being formed here because of the effect of the bio salts and bio acids. So that what is responsible for emulsification are bio salts plus the phospholipids. So even the phospholipids, they are responsible for emulsification of fat. Okay. So both bio salts and phospholipids, they are going to convert large fat glomules into smaller pieces with polar surfaces that inhibit re-aggregation. So without fat and phospholipids, you find that even if you, you emulsify fat, they can re-aggregate, they can come to fat. So the function is emulsification. So it's the same, what is happening here, then it's also going to enhance absorption of fat. So you can see, once you have emulsification of fat, then you have lipase that will digest the fat into monoglycerides and fatty acids. And these can easily uh, move across the phospholipid barrier because they are, they are fats. So fats, you know, they can easily cross the phospholipid barrier. They are fats in nature. So they'll cross the phospholipid barrier to enter the interstitial cells. Then by the lacteals, they'll be transported via the lymphatic system back to the cardiovascular system. Okay, so the enzymes that are responsible for digestion are called lipase. So lipase enzymes, they'll be able to degrade the triglycerides to monoglycerides and fatty acids. Then later on, the monoglycerides and fatty acids, they'll enter the absorptive cells by simple diffusion because they are fat soluble, or they will aggregate to form loosely held micelles. So these micelles are happening maybe within the cells, or within the lumen. So in the lumen, they need to be digested for them to be absorbed because muscles are bigger than the monoglycerides and fatty acids. So muscles are just a group of fatty, uh, fatty acids and also bowel salts and a bit of phospholipids. So they are called muscles, but they are smaller than the fat globules. The regulation of secretion and emptying of the gallbladder, you have the nervous regulation, the vagus vagus reflex, vago vago reflex. Then you also have hormonal regulation via the cholecystokinin, gastrin, secretin, somatostatins. Then we also have bowel sorts, so the enterohepatic circulation that can also stimulate the production and secretion of bowel sorts, enterohepatic secretion. So the nervous regulation, the hormonal regulation is similar. You know the effect of these hormones and neuro innovation to the uh, secretion 
from the, the liver itself. So let's, let's look at the secretion. So we said if bowel is not being released into the, uh, the duodenum because the sphincter of all is closed, it will be stored within the gallbladder. So you can see bowel is being produced by the liver, but it will be stored in the gallbladder. Then there is modification. There will be reabsorption of water and a bit of electrolytes. So because water is leaving the gallbladder, the concentration of these electrolytes is going to increase. Then the duct cells, they can release uh, bicarbonates with the presence of secretin. So secretin is stimulating the duct cells to release a lot of bicarbonates. And you know to say this bicarbonate is being exchanged for chloride. So you've already known the, the mechanism by which the secretin is going to stimulate the duct cells to release a lot of bicarbonates. So the same secretin that is influencing the release of bicarbonates from the duct cells of the pancreas it's the same mechanism that is going to stimulate the duct cells within the biliary system to release a lot of bicarbonates. Then you have stimulation from the enzyme like cholecystokinin. So cholecystokinin is being produced by the eye cells. So cholecystokinin, if there is fat, cholecystokinin production is going to increase. Then this cholecystokinin is going to be transported by the circulatory system to go to the gallbladder they need to cause contraction of smooth muscles. So the gallbladder is going to contract to squeeze bowel out of the gallbladder via the duct system. And then via the duct system, the same cholecystokinin is going to bring about relaxation of the sphincter of Odi. So the sphincter of Odi is going to relax and then bowel is going to move into the duodenum. That will, will neutralize the acid because you have bicarbonates and at the same time you have the bowel acids, bowel sorts, that will start the emulsification of fat. So you have the bowel that will be released. Then the enterohepatic circulation, circulation that is also enhanced the production and secretion of uh, bowel. So you can see, once bowel has been released into the duodenum, that will enhance the digestion and the emulsification in the duodenum. Towards the area, so the distal aspect of the ileum is going to absorb much of the bowel acids. So you have channels and um, mechanism that will allow absorption of bowel. So bowel will move via the portal vein back to the liver. So that bowel that is moving to, back to the liver, it will enhance the production of bowel. So about 95% of bowel is being recycled back to the liver via the portal vein because of the enterohepatic circulation. So 95% is coming back to the liver. So you can see once bowel has been produced, about 5% is being produced by the hepatocytes, the 95% is being recycled. So you can see this bowel that is being produced to be stored within the gallbladder. Once you have those stimuli that will cause the release of uh, bowel, you have cholecystokine in secretin, so you have production of bowel and bicarbonates that will be released via the sphincter of Odi. So the same cholecystokinin that is causing the contraction of the smooth muscle in the gallbladder, it will cause relaxation of smooth muscle in the hepato hepatic ampulla, the hepatopancreatic ampulla. So it's going to relax to allow bowel to move via the sphincter of Odi. So this bowel now is causing emulsification of fat that will bring about absorption of fat and the other products of fat. The 95% of bowel, it's reabsorbed back into the portal system, then it will be transported to the liver. Only 5% will leave the body into the fecal material. So the fecal material just contain about 5% of bowel, but much of it is being recycled. Okay, so I've already said that 95% of bowel is being recycled. Okay. So the, the acidic fat chyme causes the, the, the duodenum to release a lot of cholecystokinin in secretin and in circulation via the bloodstream, it will be transported to the gallbladder to cause contraction of gallbladder and to cause release of um, bicarbonates by the duct cells. So bowel salts and secretin transported in, in the blood is going to stimulate the liver to produce more bowel. So I've already told you, even the vagal stimulation, you have the vago vagal stimulus that will stimulate the contraction of the gallbladder. 
So, and also the cholecystokinin that is causing the contraction of the gallbladder. Then the sphincter of odd is going to relax. Then there will be movement of bowel into the duodenum. That will start emulsification processes. So this is what is summarizing the hepatobiliary system, especially the enterohepatic circulation of bowel. So 95% of bowel is being recycled. So in the ileum, there is reabsorption of bowel. 95% is going to be reabsorbed, only 5% will be excreted in our fecal material. 95% will enhance the production. So 5% is being produced by the hepatocytes to add to the 95%, giving you the 100%, that will be stored within the gallbladder. If there are signals for release, they need to be released, okay? Into the duodenum then it will cause emulsification of fat. So fat globules will be now broken down into smaller, smaller pieces or smaller, smaller droplets that will be worked upon by the enzymes, like the lipase into monoglycerides and fatty acids. And they can diffuse into the enterocytes because they are fat soluble. They can move across the phospholipid barrier to enter the enterocytes, and then they will be picked up by the lactules, which are part of the lymphatic system. And then the lymphatic system, they are going to empty the lymph back to the cardiovascular system. So we have the major uh, lymphatic ducts that will join at the level of the subcravian artery and to empty the lymphatic or the lymph back into the cardiovascular system. So it goes back to the circulation. So fat products, they are not transported by a hepatic porter vein. So fat products after digestion, they are not going to be transported by hepatic porter vein, but it will be transported by the lactules, which are part of the lymphatic system. So with that information, we are done with secretions. Yeah, so this is where we're going to end our today's lecture.